The assembly component of our manufacturing system plays a major role in getting our product out the door in a timely manner. If we have assembly lines, then we're going to have to think about the workstations and how the various tasks are assigned to those workstations. Also note that assembly problems will shut down the line, in other words, shut down production, so we want to avoid those at all costs. If we shut down the line, it could be due to missing components, and by this we mean that uh, we do not have sufficient materials in order to complete the assembly. It could be fitting problems that occur because of problems with our design and or other manufacturing processes that preceded us. This goes back to the notion of MMC and LMC, as well as our position and orientation tolerances. We can also have equipment problems that shut down the line, or the product itself does not function at some point, and therefore we have to shut everything down. Again, this is a drastic step. This is what you want to avoid at all costs. So how can you prevent these kinds of things? Well, hopefully some of the uh, steps we've taken already will eliminate that, but it will not do that 100%. When you set up your assembly system, one of the most important things is how you're going to allocate work content to the various workstations. When we think about the assembly workstations, there's a certain amount of uh, work that must be performed in terms of tasks, and those tasks are what we call the rational work element. Now, we're not going to go down to the level of detail in a time study, but what are the major tasks that need to be performed? And so for a given assembly task K, it's going to take T sub EK <coughs> to perform that particular assembly operation. Note these are value-added steps where we're actually adding components to other components. When we look at this idea of allocating work to the workstation, we have to keep in mind the overall goal. Now, just as in any types of work allocation scenarios, such as projects, uh, assembly, uh, whatever the task might be, what we're thinking in the back of our minds is that we have some equitable allocation such that workstations are essentially equivalent. So the amount of work that we assign to each workstation should be equivalent. Now the problem is that we have a set of discrete tasks and so these do not always add up to being equivalent across all the workstations. Well, how can we go about trying to establish the equivalent amount of work because people get concerned about uh, not doing their fair share? So if we look at work content, what we'll see is a total assembly time to perform all the tasks. And so what we need to do is to take this total work content, TWC, and divide that up amongst the workstations. So for a given workstation, we're going to have some allocation, which is obviously smaller than TWC if we have more than one workstation. <clears throat> the maximum service time, this is going to correspond to what some people call the tack time. In other words, that's the intended goal or pace that we want to keep uh, in terms of our overall production rate. So that will be an upper bound, and essentially this will also correspond to the bottleneck assembly station. Now we're assuming here again that we've got all the components that we need. If uh, we run out of components to assemble, then that would slow down our uh, ability to produce a final assembly. The other element that we have to take into account is a precedence constraint, and that has to do with geometry. For instance, if we have a housing, we have to put <coughs> all the components into the housing before we close the housing. <coughs> so we have a precedence constraint that is based upon geometry. All of this has to be taken into account. So here's a simple comparison where I have two different configurations for my assembly system. One, I do a 
a sequential set of steps and allocate work content to each of four workstations maintaining precedence, or I perform all the tasks at one workstation. Now, what's the difference in the design? Well, hopefully you recognize that the cycle time at this workstation is strictly greater than the maximum cycle time uh, or bottleneck of these four stations. And so your throughput or production rate here is greater than your production rate here. The time in the system or the manufacturing lead time, just considering these four uh, tasks that need to perform, is equivalent for both. So by dividing up the work content, we've increased our production rate. Note, of course, your production rate, our P is 1 over your cycle time. So the, there is an impact in terms of how many workstations you have and the overall production rate of your system. Let's look at a simple example that you're familiar with. Here we have our set of tasks, in this case, seven. And we have the individual times that have been determined, perhaps through a time study or most. And now we know how many minutes it takes to perform each of our assembly tasks here. If I add those up, I'll come up with the total work content, 0.62 minutes. The last piece of information I need is the precedence requirement so that I can create a precedence diagram based upon uh, tasks that have to be performed before other tasks. So here you can see the patty on the bun. That must be preceded, and don't forget this is a must, uh, before <clears throat> the lower bun on the wrapper has to be done before we can place that patty on the bun. Once we have this information for a given product, then we can think about how do we want to allocate those uh, tasks to individual workstations. We need some criteria. This goes back to this notion of fairness in that uh, each operator should have a, about the same amount of work. Of course, this isn't going to work out perfectly, so there will be some degree of imbalance. One measure of balance could be that we take the total work content divided by the number of workstations times our maximum service time, T sub S. So if you look at the denominator, this is kind of the available time that the operators have. So I've got N workstations, T sub S time possible at each workstation, and I'm going to divide that into the total work content. That will give me E sub B, or what we call balance efficiency. Related to that, we also have balance delay. This is where we'll take that available work time, subtract out the actual, so uh, you'll have some left over, and divide that through by the available work time. If you look at that, it really represents the fraction of this available work time that is lost due to imbalance. That's what this delta refers to here. And you can also see that there's a relationship between um, E sub B and D, right? Essentially, it's going to be 1 minus E sub B. So in that sense, you can think of this uh, E sub B as being the fraction of balance of the total available time. Well, if we go back to our example and we look at a service time, so I'm going to set... T sub S equal to 0 0.2 minutes. Now, how do you come up with T sub S? Really, that has to do with the demand. So wherever this final product is uh, being demanded, we need to determine what that rate should be. And from that rate, you can determine 1 over that will be the T sub S. So now I need to look at the number of workstations versus the balance efficiency if this is my total work content. And then, of course, we can calculate D based on E sub B. So if I plot that as a function of N here, what we see is a rapid decrease in the balance efficiency. You should also note, let's just make it clear here, 
that this region up here is infeasible. So we cannot have a balance efficiency greater than one, which tells us that if we look at our boundary here at one, and obviously we can't have that uh, balance efficiency greater than one because that would mean we have more time available at the workstation than is actually there. So that's why it's infeasible. So we're going to look at a value in this region here that's closest to one. So we would pick four here and that tells us how many workstations we're going to have. Another criteria we might use instead of the balance efficiency is to minimize the variation between those four workstations. The way we can look at that is to take our T sub S, which is that maximum service time, and subtract the actual for each individual workstation and square it, and that would give us some measure of variance. We could also use the average T sub S I instead of the T sub S. Again, we're trying to minimize this variance as we allocate to the individual workstations. Also note that if I have an assembly system where multiple operators are at a given station, that can obviously impact T sub S, and we might be able to reduce our T sub S value uh, given additional operators. Well, how could we approach this? There are a variety of heuristics that we can use and optimization methods. Uh, we'll take a look at a couple of them. First of all, we've got the largest candidate rule, which is based upon finding the largest task time and trying to place that in our system. So we're going to sort our, all of our elements uh, in descending order. We'll create a workstation and start assigning all the elements we can from the top of the list. Note when I say all the tasks that we can assign, that's based upon precedence being satisfied. Then we'll update our precedent requirement and then repeat the process until all elements are assigned. So it's not very complex here. Uh, one place to start is to take that precedence requirement and actually create what we call a precedence diagram, as you can see here. And that gives you a pretty good picture of what needs to take place first as you're going through uh, this largest candidate rule. So as you can see here, I've sorted all the tasks from uh, largest to smallest, and I have to look at my precedence and find a location where there is no precedence. And clearly, as we could see in this simple graph here, we know that one has to be allocated first. So that's what I'll do is I'll take one and put that in the first workstation. Now that's gone. Then I'm going to update my precedence, get rid of the ones here, and I go back to the top and I see, okay, as I work my way down, then I should pick two. Now, if I've already picked one, the time is 0 0.08. If I add two, then it's 0.19 at that station. We're getting close to the service time, don't forget, of T sub S equals 0 0.2. We can't exceed that. Uh, we'll have to go to the next station if we can't find another task uh, to fill up the gap between 0.19 and 0 0.2. So we've allocated two, we get rid of two, two, two. Now we go back to the top. I can't allocate my 0.12 here because that would take us uh, beyond our service time. So there's nothing I can really do here as I look through and now we're done. So our first workstation has task one and two. The next one starting at the top is clearly task five. And now we've gotten rid of task five eliminated here. Again, we go back to the top. I can't do seven because it has six as a precedence, can't do six, so I have to do three and four. Well, as we look here, they're both the same, so it's really a tie, and we've already assigned 0.12. We can't exceed 0.2, so now I've got to uh, make a choice here, and I'll just pick three, and that brings us to 0.19. We update our precedent, get rid of three, <coughs> and we've allocated that, okay? So now we're just down to three tasks, and again, I go to the top, and I come all the way to the bottom because number four is the only one that 
as its precedence satisfied. Now that I've allocated four, we can eliminate that precedence, and now I can allocate six. Once I've allocated six, I'm up to 0.15, so clearly I'm going to have to put seven all by itself at the next workstation. Okay. So as we can see here, there is definite imbalance uh, because we have discrete allocation. Note that seven is only busy roughly half of the time, whereas this first station here is busy most of the time. So it's not perfectly balanced, um, but it looks like the best balance that we can get given our constraint here. And of course, you can calculate E sub B, which we saw before, was less than one.